Welcome to the Lindsay Hadley Podcast Show. I'm coming to you from the North Shore of Oahu, where weekly I interview some of the world's most inspiring people from business, philanthropy, and entertainment. I love collecting humans, and these are some of my favorites I've found along the way. This podcast is brought to us by Capita Financial Network. Do you need help with the next steps of your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, state attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call or schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube. And I'm so thrilled to introduce my business partner and friend, Stephen Gyllenhaal. Stephen um, is an incredible... Yeah, welcome, welcome to the show, Stephen. So glad to have you. Stephen is um, the director of many films in Hollywood, and he has helped me on the journey of my debut as a filmmaker, as executive producer of a film that he recently directed called Uncharitable, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Some of you may know Stephen's last name um, and have affection for it because of his amazing, talented children, Maggie and Jake Gyllenhaal, who are Hollywood stars and Stephen's entire family has been in the entertainment industry. He's got an incredible story, but more than that, Stephen has an amazing life story. He's overcome trauma and trials and tribulation and such a beautiful spirit and love for humanity. And he's got one of the best hearts I know. And I'm so, so grateful to have you on Stephen. So Thank you. let's start Thanks off by having, you. yeah, well, it's sincere. So Stephen, why don't you start by sharing us, us your story? Like, you can start back as far as you want and say, I grew up here, I did this. But, like, what do you want to share? At, you know, we have amazing listeners. A lot of people on the listener podcast are really high capacity, high character people, lots of high net worth people, people that are really doing big things in the world. And, you know, when you understand who is listening, like, what would you love them to know about you? Well, I think the first thing I'd say is that I don't really know anybody who hasn't had a challenging journey. I mean, no matter where you look, when you really look and you allow yourself to look at both the bright, the brightness, the sunshine in people's lives, I've kind of come to understand the brighter things are, the shadows are that much darker. So I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable feeling like my life has been any more challenging or actually any more extraordinary than pretty much anyone's life, whether they're someone without a home that's had a struggle through that, whether there's been someone who's gone through a war, you know, um, whether someone who just lives in the suburbs and has to struggle with growing up. And so I, I think what intrigues me more in some ways than my story is the sort of dynamics it takes to overcome almost any kind of challenge. And what it really takes is, I think, being as full a human being as you can be, bring as much resources together as you can. And I think I've been pretty lucky in that regards. I, I, I grew up in a very religious community in Pennsylvania. My parents had major challenges. My father fought in World War II. He was in the sort of American blitzkrieg into Germany with Patton's Fourth Armored Division. He freed the concentration camps. He stayed in Germany the year after the war, and he never really recovered from that. Um, and I don't think anyone who's really been in war, really been in combat, most of those people never talk about it. Generally, I've heard, you know, the people who talk about their battle experiences didn't probably have them. People who did don't talk about it. And that's one of the problems. They need to talk about it. In any case, he struggled and he struggled with alcohol. And my mom also grew up um, in a complicated home. But every home is complicated, and she had issues too. So I grew up in a complicated house. I also had five younger brothers and sisters who drove me nuts. That was maybe that's my biggest, maybe that's my biggest challenge for my sibling, who I adore. My brother, I should just do a quick pitch, just came out with a book called A Wing and a Prayer, which is all about birds. And you know, this is about me. So let's let's leave my brother out of it. But he's awesome. He's born on my birthday. That so. Um, but it was really my best birthday gift. So I think, I think anyone who's grown up in a family that counts pretty much everybody. And, and in, in some ways they're lucky. If you didn't have a family, you, you're even less lucky has things to sort out. And I think, um, 
when I was young, I think my mother wanted to be an artist. I think my father also wanted to be an artist, sort of. I think he wanted to be a philosopher. He wanted to be a sailor. He wanted to be a pirate, you know, um, I think in some ways. And those inclinations in them, I think, led me toward being open to to cinema, to filmmaking. And in fact, I, I just been thinking about how there was this beautiful cathedral I grew up in went to, uh, when we moved there when I was a little bit older, but beautiful cathedral, stained glass windows. And stained glass windows were sort of medieval cinema. And I was always fascinated by those, those stained glass windows. And I think from there, I, I gained a, an appreciation of what art could do for you, even though the, gar- the art was mainly religious and gothic and, and you know, sort of wonderfully strange. But it, I didn't see movies when I was growing up at all, but I did experience art in, in that small town. And then I wanted to escape really badly, and I did, by the skin of my teeth, and went to college, and, and there discovered movies. Actually, in my senior year, I had a girlfriend who was really knew all about movies. I knew nothing about movies, except when I started watching them, and they were mostly foreign films. I went, I want to do that. That's what I wanted to. So I just was, you know... Shouldn't- didn't know enough not to kind of get in to do it. And so I did. And I started as a camera loader and as a, you know, a wing and a prayer person, like my brother's book. I'm pushing his book a little. Um, I, uh, I sort of worked my way up and I didn't know enough to not know I didn't know enough. So I just kept mm-hmm. at it. And I think, you know, anyone out there who wants to do it, you know, enjoy all the arts, literature, sculpture, painting, music. If you want to be a filmmaker, you're going to need all of those to make films. You're going to need them all to live a good life, I think, actually. Um, but for me, I had enough of an engine of something or other to just keep pushing through. And you know you know me, we've now made this film together. I just sort of don't stop. Um, in fact, I've been saying recently, when someone says no, that just means the yes hasn't shown up yet. And you just have to keep pushing. So, um, so basically that's what's happened. And I think probably the, the best part of my life, um, which I don't really even know how much I had to do with it. First of all, there's nature. I had children. I, I love my wife. <laughs> and suddenly there were two kids and I fell madly in love with my children went from the very start. And, um, and I think, you know, and they were exposed to Hollywood from the very early age, you know, show the movies and there they are out there you know moving beyond what their mom and dad did which is what kids are supposed to do so i'm really delighted by all that i watch them do you know maggie's now a a writer and a director and um and i'm sort of pushing jake you got to start thinking about directing um and he certainly produces a lot so that's sort of my story you know it's had his hard points you know but everyone's had them so I'm not going to complain yeah. too much about it. In fact, I heard a quote recently, a captain is never made on a calm sea. And there's been some not such calm mm-hmm. seas, but I'm a captain. <laughs> I survived it. So does that answer the question more or less? It's great, Stephen. And having um, worked with you, I can bear witness to your moxie that like, you know, we're going to make this happen energy because there's many things that came on um, board during the making of our film on charitable, which I'd love you to kind of talk a little bit about. Um, we started to make it right before COVID and a pandemic. And that, that, that was just a, a crazy curveball. Um, but I, I'll just share quickly that I saw a Ted talk by this amazing man named Dan Plata called the way we think of charity is dead wrong years ago, early in my career. And I was so inspired. I thought, this is revolutionary, like what he's saying. He's articulating what, I, what has been my lived experience as a professional in the nonprofit sector my whole career. And um, I basically just cold called him and said, hey, I want to make a film of like a, an actual documentary of your 90, of, you know, 90 minute exploration of your 13 minute TED talk. And he goes, crazy enough, my buddy Stephen Arty is on it. Like, and so he introduced you and I, and I think we became dear friends quickly and, and the rest is history. But what tell us a little bit about the film? And I know you've shared with me in moments that it's one of the most important films you've ever made, and um, that you feel very um, you feel very proud of the of, of the value that's come from 
film and what's going to be realized. Can you share with us this project? What got you into it? Any thoughts you want to share about Uncharitable? I'm very proud of the film. I'm proud of the filmmaking. Um, and I've been doing it a long time, so I, I bring to it a lot of experience. But it's that the film is connected to a mission. It's like it's it's connected to something so much bigger than itself. And I think for me personally, to be connected to something that's so much bigger than myself um, is, a, is a blessing beyond words. Um, it is the most important film I've made by far. There was a point, and Lindsay, you were there, when um, some people who had, who had donated and the film was completely made with donations, um, we're a little concerned. It's taking you a long time to make this film. Do you really know what you're doing? Well, yeah, I know what I'm doing. So came and showed the film. And one of, one of the donors who had not a lot to do with it, his daughter had a lot more to do with it, saw the film. There's an airplane out there. Usually we would say, hold it for a second, but we're going to keep going. Um, uh, it's, it's a helicopter, actually. You know, it's helicopters. So that's my, that's my filmmaker side playing out. But anyway... He saw the film, and then about two months later, we, we met again, and we were sort of saying, well, how did the film affect you? And he said, well, you know, I'll tell you. He said, uh, two days after seeing the film, a woman from the Ukraine called me and said, would you, would you um, maybe help us build some houses in Kiev? And he said, rather than what I had always done before seeing the movie, when I would have said, you know, what's your overhead? I want to go through all your books really carefully. I want to check out everything. I want to kind of spend some time really exploring. And so all I said was, how do you scale this? How do you scale it? And he said by hearing the way she described how she would scale it, I got involved. And he said three days ago, that was two months after he'd first seen the movie, 130 homes went out around Kiev on trucks and were set up for families. And I there burst into tears. Mm -hmm. And this is even before the film has come out. And already there are 130 homes, families. He's now expanding it even bigger, which is really what the film is about, yeah. which is how do we scale 10 million people in a sector in the United States committed to doing good, who have lived by the skin of their teeth, many of them, never generally paid enough, a sector that isn't really allowed to market like the for-profit sector, um, isn't really allowed to take risks like the for-profit sector, has been told, keep your head down, be humble, you know, just do your job quietly. We're going to scale that. I mean, very simply, I'm passionate and a little angry and really looking forward to taking not just the charitable sector now, but everyone that surrounds it and say, let's now really talk about changing everything. Because if we can take those 10 million people and treat them the way they deserve to be treated, get enough money into the sector that it deserves to get into, solving pretty much every major problem, every, almost every major problem sits under the umbrella of the charitable sector. And that's what this movie was designed to do, and we've now done enough screenings, and that one screening was an example to know after six years, Lindsay, you know, by, by this, you know, by hanging on by our fingernails, you know, um, just barely, barely surviving a lot of them, and the, and the pandemic, and just the challenges of making a film. We've made a film that I'm very proud of because it's an emotional experience. And I shouldn't even say the word film. I've been saying use the film, use this thing. Use the word movie. This is a mainstream movie. This is designed for everybody who cares about anybody, and that's pretty much everybody, to get involved and change their mind about not just how they donate to the charitable sector, but get involved if you haven't gotten involved. You know, it's been a joy for me. It's been a challenge, but it's been much more filled with joy being involved with all of this. So that's the film, more or less. Uh -huh. Well, Stephen, thank you for that synopsis. You were, um, I was there when, when, when Deloitte shared that, the donor shared that, and you teared up, and it was really a precious moment. I, I just feel like those, it's like the payoff from all of that, the, the sweat and tears, the hard work and the struggle. And you're so right. It's just the beginning. And 
Um, there's a scene in the film where you have the CEO of TED interviewed and he says that Dan's talk is the most persuasive talk in the history of TED stages. And I really believe that this documentary is probably the most persuasive documentary in the history of documentaries um, for social impact. I really do because it's such a big idea. I, you know, and I'm biased. Okay. So, uh, you know, as the executive producer, I, I'm so proud of what it can do. And um, because it's one of those special things where, you know, you hear the word awareness in charity and sometimes my skin crawls. What does that mean? Just, okay. Yeah. There's a climate problem. Okay. Yeah. There's kids being trafficked. All right. There's, you know, cancer. I don't need more awareness of the bad things in the world. I want solutions. But in this case, this is actually a paradigm shift that if we change our thinking, immediately our behavior then shifts. And so the general idea is that there's a demonization of overhead that is an archaic um, concept that comes from our Puritan roots where we would penance for, our, you know, for our sin. And so uh, by doing charity, we would basically do good in order to like not be as bad of people. And now we've realized that's crazy. You can do good for yourself and do good for the world. And the same levers that we use in the private sector, like hiring the best talent, taking um, risks, you know, spending money on marketing, investing in a community of compassion the way we would invest in a community of consumption is the right way to go. And to think about the scale of people's dreams, the size of their overhead. I'll just quickly share. Um, there's a, an analogy I always give. I say, hey, if I did a fundraiser and I had lemonade stand and I had 100 um, percent of the money going to the cause or no overhead because I donated all the sugar and all the lemons and my kids did it and we had cardboard boxes we raised a hundred dollars for the cause you care about versus if I put on a massive music festival, like I have, um, with Jess Larson, you know, and we put on a big festival and it costs $5 million, but raised 10 million, even though it's 50% overhead, which do you think you prefer for your thoughts? You know, the 50% overhead and $5 million of the hundred dollars. So it will utterly betray you if you look at overhead as a way to determine the utility of value. And so Jess, I wanted to give you a chance to kind of, you know, segue this. You have helped you know, you've founded a nonprofit. You've been in this space for a long time. What questions does this bring up for you, for Stephen? Yeah. Well, you know, I remember when we met at Lindsay. You probably don't meet. You probably don't remember me because there was lots of people there. I remember meeting you at Lindsay's house a couple of years. No, ago. I, I, you were very familiar. I'm going, where did I know him from? I, just, I knew him from somewhere. Now I know him. Oh. So you were from yeah. yeah. And, you know, I thought it was an interesting idea. And, you know, I can say that but really, Lindsay launched Child Rescue for us 14 years ago and through the big con that got some to Redstone to made enough that, and our charity for like several years off of that, right? And um, having been around the space um, and getting to see so many things that you guys address in the film, like, I mean, I'll just be honest, like before the film, like it sounded like a good idea. I saw the limitations, like conceptually it made sense. I just know that every time I talk about nonprofit stuff, people immediately start talking to me about bragging about how little somebody spends on overhead instead of talking about how much good somebody does or things like that. And so I, I was like, I'll just say I was, I was skeptical. I was like, hey, this is, this is a great film and it's what should happen and everybody's going to ignore it. Like just, you know, and then I watched it. And when I went to the screening, like you guys made a complete convert out of me and I, it was a, it wasn't until maybe three quarters of the way through the film until I really had hope. Like, oh my gosh, the people who are doing the best things in the world might actually be able to start having the resources they need to do it. Because this, you know, Ed Norton, head of TED, I mean, you guys had so many high credibility folks in here and then such tangible stories that you can sink your teeth into that it just logically irrefutable in my opinion. By like three quarters of the way through the film, I was like, this could work. This could like, this could literally change at least how our country works, if not how the whole world addresses this problem. And then the people who are doing a lot of the most important work in this world could actually have what it takes to get more. And I just got so wildly optimistic. And so it's not a question. It's just like my congratulations. I can't believe no, you I pulled it, it off. It it's amazing. I, no, I think it is a yeah. question. Because I think, I think, um, what I, there's a piece now going on, finish the film or almost finished. I drive Lindsay, everyone crazy. Cause it's like last little, you know, there's technical things now, you know, and there's a whole thing. Lindsay, I don't think you even know now with the end song. Now there are people interested in 
doing a single, a record single and going for Grammys and Oscars and all these things were sort of playing with it. Really getting concrete. <laughs> so we'll talk about more of that later. But, um, but now we're at the point the film is done. It looks like we're going to be releasing in 50 to 100 theaters or cities. We're sort of playing with all of that. We have a premiere in New York at the DGA, which is the, one of the best theaters on 57th Street in Manhattan. Um, on September 21st, then we open theatrically in New York the next day, the 22nd. Then we do a screening. We do a premiere down in, in Washington, D.C. to deal with sort of the VIPs there to begin to sort of stir things up there, start to raise some trouble there. Then we're in L.A. The, that that next Friday opening Lemley Theater and and it's opening and we're going wider and wider than Boston, Chicago. So that's and we still need money to do that. So anyone who wants to give us some money, I'm here and so is Lindsay. Um, because it's all sort of a wing and a prayer still at this point, but it's beginning to build into something bigger. Now, that's the second half. And I used to joke with Lindsay and say, when we're finished the film, we're on the 50 yard line. She's heard it a thousand times. We're now on the 30 yard line heading towards the touchdown. So, so, but that's, but that's only the first piece. And even the movie you've seen is only the first piece because I'm no longer interested in talking about overhead. The movie does that. I'm no longer interested in really interested and i will do it but i'm not really focused on talking about the right to, have, to risk the right to get capital from you know from the you know for the for the nonprofit, not the nonprofit, but the mission-driven charitable sector that begins to compare with what people get in the for-profit sector that's going to begin to happen that's the dialogue i'm now looking at down the road a little bit now down the road a little bit now that it keeps this ball rolling because i think you're right i think people will talk 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 and Oh, I believe this. And, oh, I believe that. And I'm the same way. You have so many things going on. You got to keep it going. So I want to do a TV show. Lindsay and I have talked about it afterwards. And I want to do, go back to those events that Dan wanted to go back to. Like, you know, the AIDS rides. Like breast cancer walks. Only it's 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 people walking post-pandemic for a lot, a lot of events. But, you know, what Dan learned, which is most important, I think most important about all of this, and even the film, I think, captures it, which is on those walks, on the TV show, in the audience when you're watching the movie, you feel good about yourself. You feel hopeful. The cynicism begins to fall away. You know, I, I've always been saying charity is nonpartisan. It's right, left, and center. I want, I want everyone on the right wing. I grew up in that community. I love them. I want them to see this film. I want all Joe Biden's people sort of in the middle or wherever the middle sits now to see this. And I want all Bernie Sanders people to see it, too, because they're, we're all in this together from a charitable perspective. So there's a joy in this. And I think finally, there's something I've been playing with recently is this concept of selflessness. I need to be selfless. I don't agree. We need to be selfish. We need to be there for ourselves first. That's what charity really is about, is being there for yourself. And then you can be there for other people in a really genuine way, in a really important way, in the way we really need it, which is we need each other. I need to be with someone who cares about themselves. Then I know they're going to care about me. And I need to be there caring about myself. And I stay away from the people who are really lost, but the people who have some sense of self. And that's one of the things that's been taken away from this sector. You know, I, I joked around a little bit about it in a couple of things I've talked about, you know, saying, you know, all of you in the, you know, in the, in the, in the nonprofit sector, in the charitable sector, I want this movie to, to, to ultimately make it possible so that when you go back to your class reunion and you say you work in a charity, they don't look over your shoulder, but who to talk to next. They look at you as a hero. I go back to my class reunion, you know, I'm in Hollywood. I got kids that are movie stars. It's awesome and fun. You know, but if I went back and said I've been working in charity, I want to someday be able to go back and say, and I have my own nonprofit as well, and have people go, wow, you and everyone else who works in this sector are the real heroes, the real heroes. In a way, that's what I want the film to be for every single person working in the sector, to have a sense of self, to be selfish, to know that they're doing this for selfish reasons, and to get over this sort of old-fashioned idea to be selfless. So anyway, so I'm, off, I'm off my soapbox now, but that's, that's what I've been sort of feeling. <laughs> well, I mean, I even look at us at Child Rescue. We're, we are a new program we're doing right now. We're raising money for um, police scholarships so they can learn 
advanced classes for going after like the most violent fist groups that are trapped, you know, MS-13, drug cartels, right? And we set it up like all the overhead to the charity right now is being covered by this so that we can go to people and say, hey, listen, you're donating here to this cause. And like you know, the charity water example and the things that you do, like being like taking people where they're at, but like being smart enough to go like, okay, society hasn't, sh- hasn't shifted yet, but here's how we can do things of like, I'm covering our team to get this done so that we can take some years of that. And then hopefully once they're part of the track <laughs> and they become child rescue donors and they're, they're paying for these police scholarships, hopefully I'd be like, Hey, great. One of the other things we want you to do is watch this film that my friend made. Right. And, and start that conversation and like bring them into the fold first and then help minds and, and, you know, we certainly think it would help us more kids out of harm's way. And so it's a useful tool for me. Thank you for raising so much money and spending these years of your life to build it for us. Yeah, the movie's the movie is one hundred percent overhead, by the way. One hundred percent overhead. And it's gonna be more impactful than any 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 donation to it. I mean, it's hard to kind of process that, you know, oh, I'm giving to this, but long term the yeah. impact on not just the charitable sector, but on the world is gonna be exponential because of changing minds. I think, you know, um Scott Harrison and I and, and Dan and I have talked about his model, which I think Short term isn't a bad idea because it's focused on the problem. The problem with the problem. Sorry. It couldn't, the problem with the problem is that you need the people who are solving the problem to feel good about themselves. That it should be an easy thing. Ah, water. <laughs> there you go. that we should be supporting the people that are doing the work. But for this to really take off, we've got to stop this idea that for the people who are doing the work in, in the trenches or in the office, the secretary or whatever, those people need to be paid as well as the people in the for-profit sector. It's, I'm not going to go so far as to say they should be paid more, but in my heart, I think they should be. Because they're committing to problems. They're sitting there going, how do I solve the problem of homelessness? How do I so- how to solve the problem of these children dying of drugs? How do I solve the problem of children being kidnapped and macerated by whatever happens to them? How do the people get in there and solve those problems? And, you know, how do you solve the problem of a clock when you're coughing? So... I think it's a, it's a really critical mindset difference to go, no, you know, I think you have to do it right now. I think it's just a question. It's, it's what you're involved with and the sector is involved with is survival. Survival is not a good place to be to solve any problem. The good place so, to be to solve a problem is to be joyful and optimistic and feeling good about yourself, being, living well, you know, what is it? Living well is the best revenge. In a way, I think it's really true. Um, We want a robust, ambitious, imaginative, outside the box, brilliant sector. And the film is really about getting to that place. That's awesome. You know, we've kind of been alluding to this. Lindsay, I'm going to turn it over to you. it's pretty incredible, um, this idea of de-risking a film and the idea of non-dilutive financing. Can you can you talk about that idea? It's, it's pretty powerful for a mission-driven movie like this. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about that, Jess. Like, look, I was brand new in the filmmaking, um, and Stephen has been a great mentor, and and I've been learning a lot, and a great learning curve, and now I'm producing a lot of different you know television and films, and it's been a lot of fun. But you know, traditionally, most film is done through investment. Um, so people put up their money and then they own equity in the film and they see a return. But because social impact films, particularly this film and others, have such a utility on their face, they actually they actually are making a major impact if it brings um, education awareness or 
a paradigm shift like to the degree that this film can. And I really believe, Jess, it's not a small thing when you're just like, I think this could really change the world. It's like, man, phrases like that can so- sound so such hyperbole. I, you know, I'm the queen of hype, everybody says, where I'm just like, it's going to be amazing. But like, I only, I only sell what I buy. And the reality is that, you know, we can put someone on the cover of Forbes for making violent video games. Why can't we put someone on the cover of Forbes for ending domestic violence? Why do we spend millions of dollars because we value and are entertained by someone putting a ball in a hoop? Why do we do that as a culture, a society? We're like, oh, I want to be entertained. That your prowess, your, you know, your incredible athleticism, watching that display it brings me joy. It excites me. What if we had that kind of value of people who solve the world's problems? What if we were like, that is so inspiring. That lights my soul up. I'm engaged. I'm enrolled. I want to invest and bet on. Them. We could change that by the way we think. And we don't have to think, well, and every great movement that we look at from the civil rights movement, the movement to women to, you know, um, LGBTQ, gender equality, all this stuff, you look at what's come in society and how it shifted and it's just changing our thinking, right? So um, I really think in terms of the film world, I think there's a ton of potential for that too. People that can go, hey, there's a lot of risk in filmmaking. Um, I have philanthropic dollars that are set aside that are tax exempt, maybe my donor advised fund, you know, a Capita financial network that sponsors uh, podcast, they we manage like hundreds of DAFs for our clients, and we set aside these charitable giving amounts that are now tax exempt and have to go to a cause. What if you, as a as a you know um, a donor, decided to give your uh, donation to a film that then enables all kinds of utility and value for the sector, or all kinds of for the issue you care about, whether it's human trafficking or whatever. So to leverage it that way, you don't see a financial return per se personally, but you know, the, the value could be maintained by the filmmakers, which is incredible. I wish again, there's a whole thing, a breakdown of the system in Hollywood right now and filmmakers, what's going on in the world, which, which I won't digress on. But the idea is like just to use capital in a way that can enable these valuable things that then can make our follow on investments in these programs better. Right. So if we change the demonization overhead and suddenly people are being paid not the best best available people are being hired in the nonprofit sector but the best people period are being hired right that 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 follow-on investment from that same family or their friends that are philanthropists is only going to have a greater utility if we have better marketing then it becomes this amazing snowball if you can tell stories better and sell so much of the fundraising world is how well you tell a story is how well you communicate the value proposition to the planet and build donor confidence that is so effectively done by filmmaking and storytelling like what Stephen does. So, you know, it's really um, a stunning opportunity to uh, see people use that. So thanks for that question, Jess. And, and, and is it kind of like what Drew Fitzgerald was talking about on our previous episode about program-related investments, is how they can, they can donate to a for-profit organization? Thank you for bringing that up. That's another option. Nonprofit entities, some of them are structured through their bylaws and they can set them up this way to give program related investments, which means they can actually, from their charitable donations, give the investment in a project for profit, could be film, could be anything else, and see a return back to their philanthropic bucket. So imagine you know, this money going out, doing good and having impact. And then if it wins, they get money back. In our case with the film, all these benefactors gave it with no equity play at all. They just are letting the filmmakers maintain the potential financial upside, which is really cool because Stephen has worked really hard. I hope we, I hope we, because I'm a, a part owner of the film, I hope we realize all the value from all this incredible effort, you know. Well, it you know, brings up another question maybe for Stephen of, you know, this is so fascinating and Lindsay's able to do this, but people are fascinated with, with film in general where you spent your entire career, you know, and actually yesterday on the show, was one of the producers of The Dark Knight that your daughter was in. And uh, and we were talking about like how often people maybe don't do due diligence or they don't know how to do the due diligence and they maybe became wealthy at something else and they decide they're going to become film investors and they quickly lose their money. If you had, a, you know, based on your decades of experience, if you had advice for investors who maybe it isn't mission-driven one, it's a donation one, this is just an investment. What's one of the best pieces of advice you would have for um, investors new to entertainment, specifically for film? My advice was, look, I've been in this for a lot of years. Give me all your money. <laughs> That's my advice. Love it. Okay, no, my second piece of advice. Need... My second piece of advice. Well, you know, my second piece of advice, why are you doing it? 
Why, why do you, you, I don't, I don't love, and, and, and Scott Harrison talked about, it, I don't love the idea I'm going to give back. It's sort of like I took my whole life and I made a, a billion dollars. Now I'm going to give back. You're kind of going, maybe you could think about it differently because in a way there's a guilt in that. They know, I mean, in many cases, you know, they, they, they did some tough stuff to get the money, you know, and it's like, let the guilt go. You've got this. Don't give back exactly like you've done something wrong. Why do you want to do it as a human being? I think that's what, you know, that's what my whole nonprofit's about is mental health and being a human being. And but it's like, let's now examine giving that money for what reasons. Okay, you want to be on a red carpet, be on a couple of red carpets. It's not so great. Okay, so, you know, you want to meet movie stars. I know movie stars, just people, you know. And most of the time they don't return your phone calls anyway, even my kids, you know. So it's like, you're know, all so busy. So what, what is the deeper reason? What's the reason it's going to give you something? Well, you know, invest in things that matter to you. First of all, take a little time. You made all these billions or millions or hundreds of millions or whatever. Take a little time and just think about what do I want to do? What, what do I want? Not so much what I want to leave, you know. I mean, this whole idea of I'm going to have names named after me. I had, when I went to elementary school, it was Marshall School. Marshall was dead. For a long time, it doesn't matter names after you. What matters is that you know deep in your life that you that you've given something that makes you feel good. Coming back to being selfish again, so I'd say, think about what really matters to you. Do children matter to you? Well, then invest in kid movies. Don't put all your money in. Listen carefully. Have some smart people around you. I'm a smart person, you know, or some other people. But do you care about? climate then look carefully i mean you know someone said that um there was a, some statistics done on um day after tomorrow the film that jake was in uh, uh dennis quaid where uh no was that the day after tomorrow yeah, it was was that the one with the everything froze and um that compared to an inconvenient truth it had more impact in terms of climate changing people's views on climate change than inconvenient truth now, people have been saying that, that this movie is the next inconvenient truth. And I think, and actually, um, Meredith Blake, who's um, one of the executive producers on this, is um, it, it did an inconvenient truth. And I think an inconvenient truth is very important. This film is more emotional in many ways than inconvenient truth. Also, an inconvenient truth had Al Gore, which made it sort of lean to the left. And this is really centrally based, you know, much more part, you know, this, it's nonpartisan. But I think it's being really smart. If, you're, if you've made a lot of money, you've you got to be pretty smart. So take those smarts and apply them to your heart. Get out of your head and get into your heart. And invest in what maybe your children would like to see. Maybe you got teenage kids, so you invest in some teenage movies. So I'm going to ask one follow-up, and then I'm going to hand it back to Lindsay, because I know she's got lots of questions. So let's say... Let's just play pretend that Jess is like some multi-billionaire. This is, I like the story already. Okay. And, uh, you know, and I figured out, Hey, this is, this is where I care about. This is where I want to invest, but I don't want those monies to go down the drain. I don't want it to be like with one of these slimy producers and all the money goes in their pocket instead of on the screen. And I'm trying to avoid the snakes in the grass of working with the right people. So my last, I guess, kind of my follow up there before I hand it back to Lindsay is this idea. Okay. I've decided I'm going to put my for-profit investment where my heart is and, and also support art. But I also want to see that money back so we can do it over again. Um, you know, there's so many people that, that lose their money on independent film and, and TV and stuff. And if you had one piece of advice for those folks who are they're trying to put their money where their heart is, but they're also trying to make sure they're working with the right people who can, what they say they're going to do. It sounds so basic, but yet, so many people are unable to do it in Hollywood. What, what's one piece well, of you advice know what that I'd you'd say, have? My piece of advice there, I haven't really asked this to think it through, but what I would say is think of it as being going from elementary school to college, okay? And Lindsay's, you know, has, has, been, has been going through that process as we've been working on all this. Don't invest a lot at first so you can lose it and learn the lessons, you know, don't, don't, don't try and do it. It's, it's, there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut in any of it. It's, it's like, you're going to build a building. You think you can just build a building without, you know, it's like, it takes a long time. 
takes a long time to do it well. You have to make a lot of mistakes. And, and with a movie, you make you go down a lot of dead ends. You have to sometimes be in the editing room forever. One of the things that I think I've learned that a lot of executives have learned and a lot of people don't know is I have amazing ideas. I look at the film, I have amazing ideas. I think it was like a butterfly is floating around in me. Many people go, that matters. I've learned 80% of the butterflies, the genius ideas, the Galileos, the Michelangelo ideas I have are wrong. They don't work. They go back to the drawing board and you do it again and you listen to people and you do all that. So my, my advice is start medium, small, don't rush it. Imagine you're going to live for a while and don't invest a lot. Tell yourself you're in kindergarten and you may really get screwed by some snakes. You then know, don't go to that snake. But then you hear from other people or you meet someone. And again, use your heart. Sit down, talk with some people. Do I trust this person? Oh, he's really cool. He's really dressed really nicely. He came up in that. That may not be the best way of choosing. Feel it's all about heart, finally. And it's it is a wacky business. I've made movies that have been big hits, movies that have been failures, you know, really nasty, horrible people in the business. And they're delightful, wonderful people. Sometimes the nasty ones make great movies. Sometimes the really nice people make lousy movies. So it's like, it, but you learn. And I think you learn to be a human being in the process. And in the process, it teaches you. I mean, Hollywood is, has taught me so much. You know, I love Hollywood. I love it. You know, I hate it and I love it. So I think start in kindergarten, don't do much. And then do third grade, then get a little more. Then you get into high school, you throw some more in and in high school, the hormones kick in and you really screw up and you lose everything there. But you haven't spent everything and you don't, you don't jump out of the business. You kind of go back in again. You don't, you don't make, you probably don't make a film with your nephew. That's not where you want to do it. You want to, it's, it's like, it is brain surgery. It's brain surgery. People used to say, oh, it's not brain surgery. It is brain surgery. We're working on the brain as much as a brain surgeon is. Work with professionals. And, you know, sometimes you pay them well, sometimes you give them back end, whatever you work out. You know, it's like, it's, um, so anyway, is that enough, enough of an answer? <laughs> It's great. It's it's simple advice, but it's solid. You should build an Airbnb before you try and build a, a giant skyscraper, right? Exactly. Lindsay, I've been hogging the questions here. I know you've nope. got tons of them. What are you thinking? You're great, Jess. Um, yeah, Stephen, I was thinking about you. You sat with me and shared some really great advice as a parent. I mean, a lot of our listeners are parents, and you've had a really unique position to be a parent to to radically successful and famous people that, you know, the world has wanted a piece of. And I've heard you say these little things that I've taken home and like stored in my heart as to be a better mom. You're just like, yeah, what it's, I think one of the, the Stevenisms I, I kept up, up for parenting was, it's just not about you and you're the parent. Like, don't make it about you. You know, like I find myself, I finally have like a teenage, I have teenage sons and I want to be like, dude, I'm doing this cool thing. Let me tell you about it. No, they want to tell me about the cool things we're doing, right? And Stephen, uh, you really pointed that out to me of like, you, because I was, I was asking them about how much your kids know about the film and their thoughts. And you're like, well, I mean, they'll come to the premiere to support their dad. But like, I don't talk to them about anything I'm doing. Everything's about what they're exciting thing they're doing um, yeah. because I'm a, a dad. And I just, I love your thoughts about how have you navigated the treacherousness of Hollywood, the world wanting a piece of your kids, people using you as a vehicle to your kids? Some of these different things, what advice do you have to parents as they look at their children as people? And especially if their kids are really incredible achievers. You know, my one of my best friends just released a video on Instagram. His son is a legitimate piano prodigy. He's been doing piano for two months. He's eight years old. They didn't know. This just came out of nowhere. And he's performing at concert level music and he's has it all memorized he can do like hours of the songs and it, it, the complication for what he's doing in two months is he's a prodigy and so they're now going we got to get a steinway we got to put music video that we got to put together we have to support this and i mean so there's a lot of different people while most of our listeners probably don't have a list celebrities as kids they do have children that have a massive dream putting themselves out there what would you what would advice would you give because I, I felt like i bought so many gold nuggets knowing you over the years well, I think, um, first of all, I think from a psychological perspective, and that's a lot of what I deal with, with, with my institute, my, my um, charitable organization, nonprofit institute, is human development is miraculous from conception to death. It's a miraculous, miraculous thing. And the more one studies it, 
the more it's almost incomprehensibly miraculous. It's especially mm-hmm. true, I think, until you're in your 20s. And I think there's a real risk in just having very gifted children, a great piano player, a great actor, or whatever, um, to put the focus on that talent. The more important thing is, I can't say I did this perfectly at all as a parent, passively well, just their kids. They're just little mm. kids. And maybe they have gifts. I mean, I have an eight-year-old now too. I have grandkids. I have grown kids and I have an eight-year-old and he's amazing. And I mean, as I said to someone, I make him smart and pretty and uh, and he's both. <laughs> And, and he can do math way beyond me already at eight years old. He wants to do algebra this summer. But he's still a little kid. Wow. And I think the most important thing is to be there for the little kid. And to not get dazzled by what is special about them. Because sometimes what's special about them is also caused by trauma to some degree. It's complicated. It's very, very complicated around where it is. Where do these gifts come from and what can they do to you? And you see many actors and many artists and many people who are gifted. You know, I'm a total fan of Elon Musk and Tesla. And I just don't know what's going on with him. And I'm sad for him. I just, it's, you know, it's, but it's because his, of his gifts, I think. And, and they can get confused. And I hope he gets straightened out ultimately because we need people like that. But it's difficult. So I'd say the most important thing being a parent is to be there for the little kid. And in a way, that's true with adults too. I'm a little kid in many ways. And I've really honored that part of me more and more. Curious. And and I think one of the things about that, um, I've been working on a memoir because I am writing a memoir and sort of getting through it. <laughs> Some, someone said, you're a narcissist. I said, yeah, I guess I sort of am. You know, I'm writing a memoir. But, but I, in the process of doing it, I really researched things. I had three really, really screwed up grandparents. I mean, really screwed up, really bad. And then I had one I didn't know anything about. And that one was the one who I now understand. And if you get into transgenerational trauma and all these things that are the psychological world, you know, all the things that went wrong in the past, there are also things that went right. And my grandmother, who I only knew as Seashore Granny, who went and picked little pebbles off the shore and made, made um, cross buns, who I didn't really know very well, was the magic potion in my family. She had seven kids. Her husband committed suicide when they were all young. She raised them. She got them all through college. And she was a writer in a little town, very religious little town of Pennsylvania where no one did anything. She was a, a feminist. And she wrote papers. She wrote wow. articles from McCall's Magazine, which is a big magazine back then. She was getting published in McCall's Magazine. And she wrote it about, she wrote articles about the importance of chaos in child rearing. And if there's one thing I didn't even understand I had been influenced by, because I didn't know anything about her, was my father's inclination, having been raised with a sense that chaos was wonderful, um, that came into my life, that I brought into my child rearing, without even knowing that she was the influence behind it. That That she understood way before almost anyone else, as a feminist in a totally conservative town, uh, and a rebel, she was from the South, post-Civil War, a rebel who went, chaos is critical. So I'd throw that into the mix. Mm-hmm. Let the children be chaotic. Yeah, Let so things ha- be messy. So if you're freaking out about, think, oh, my um, God, my house is- it's okay. So that's all I got. That's what I got. <laughs> affirmation i think most parents will appreciate a permission to be to to allow chaos um steven i know we're coming up short on time my last my last question for you is what uh what do you hope most for the next you know you're in this kind of this next act of your life you know and you've you've done so many basic things you've been and seen so much you've been a part of rooms and conversations and experiences most people probably couldn't even dream of. You really have had a fast state life. And I love how you say, hey, I'm just like everybody else. And that's true in, 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 in this yeah. sense that you are just a person, but you also have had extraordinary exposure and opportunities and things. And 
I know you don't take that for granted. It's just why you care so much about this film and the impact it can have on the world because that stewardship of I have had all this opportunity. I have to do more to it. diminish suffering and bless and do good things out of this place of gratitude. But what is it that you hope for this this next phase of your life as a grandpa and you're still raising a little boy, an eight-year-old? Luke is so cute. You're right. You do make them beautiful. That's very true. Yeah. And smart and smart. Um well, you know, it's interesting you 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 um ask that because when I was talking about the billionaires um and um finding what they're what they really cared about, I'm kind of um wealthy in a whole different way, profoundly privileged as a white guy. No question about it. Profoundly privileged by the education that I got being a white guy, being in a way in a family like the grandmother I had who believed in college and all those kinds of, even though there's a lot of bad stuff, profoundly, profoundly privileged. So I had a passport kind of to the world, even when I had no money as a kid, to travel around and not get shot at or be, you know, or any of the kind of things that happen with people who are not white. There's a lot of problems. I got carte blanche in a lot of ways because I was also um, good enough looking and charming enough to, to get away with a lot of stuff. And I think, and then I became a filmmaker and smart I really had accent. Smart and beautiful. Smart and beautiful. <laughs> um, and, 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 and then I became a filmmaker. I had, had access to the world. Access to the world. Anyone I wanted to interview, I could interview. So you know, because I did a session with you, that it's really weird hmm. what I did and what I've learned. And what I've learned is I think a discovery only because of having privilege as a filmmaker that there's something called resonating that human beings can do in a profound way, profound way in which without much, actually it happens with everyone anyway, we're sensing in an astonishingly nuanced way each other. So that with a little bit, so for instance, you go to, you go to a party and most of us kind of freak out and we either drink, Still read to deal with it, or we don't go to parties, or we talk too much, or whatever. We're picking up all these different sort of like orchestras of feeling that everyone is, everyone is experiencing. So what I'm really interested in doing in this next part of my in this last part of my life, in the next part of my life, is to take this discovery, which I think is, is as important almost as Copernicus and Galileo, and the fact that the Earth circles the sun, and make clear to people that. The solution here is to do what I think I'm doing at the Institute, which is this method where you can pick up other people's traumas at a very early stage. And because it's in the body, because it's almost nonverbal, you can go back to conception, back to preverbal development. I go on and on, so be careful. But I think that's, you know, as I say it, it almost sounds a little crazy. I want to take it from being sort of like wacky idea to being as clear to people as the earth circles the sun. Because I think it's the way that we can, the way I can, beyond I'm charitable and some of these other things, have people see how miraculous they are. And so I'm doing a TV show about, it's an it's a action show that involves resonating. I'm doing a musical that's, um, that's a movie, a movie musical that is also involving that with someone who goes back from the dying and all these things. And I'm doing a documentary called the universe sings because everything is vibrating. Everything is quantum. Everything has frequencies. So that to me is, so I'm kind of off on whatever, on a journey of, of sort of the universe sings on, on a journey of into music and that we're all musical instruments. We can pick up each other. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm going to do with the, with the next part, the last part of my journey, really. That's amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Stephen, and for I'm it's, I've had it's a joy to work with you. You have the best heart, and I've really learned a lot. You have that amazing nurturing, mentoring energy, and you do have some real gifts and are smart and are good looking. I'll just give you that. So, thanks again and for coming. Thanks add, again. And I want to just add, yeah, this move would never have gotten done without Lindsay Hadley. That's her right there. Oh, Lindsay Hadley having come on board. And, and made it happen. And it would have been impossible. I mean, plain and simply impossible without Lindsay. So thank you. Anytime you want me to do anything, I'm there for you. <laughs> okay. Thanks, brother. Thanks so much. Thank All you, right. guys.
Thanks. Okay, okay, take care. Do you need help with the next steps for your financial plan? Think Capita. Capita is a financial network built around you. They have a team of financial advisors, CPAs, estate attorneys, Medicare providers, and social security experts to help you accomplish your financial goals. Call to schedule a complimentary consultation at 801-566-5058 or visit their website at www.capitafinancialnetwork.com. You can also check out their financial education podcast, The Financial Call, available on Apple, Google, Spotify, and YouTube.